just two days ago. This wall in my bathroom wasn't there. See, no wall. There you go, there's my proof. So today I'm gonna to show you how to build it, board it, and tape and joint it, which with a little bit of know-how, I think any DIYer can do. Before I can build this stud partition wall, there's a couple of things that I need to get out of the way first. So it's got to that time where I need to take out the floor of the walk-in wardrobe while leaving the tiles of the existing bathroom, because I don't want to touch those, which does mean that I need to cut them and then break them all out. Now, to do that, I do have to sort of fix on exactly where this wall is going to go. And a couple of things I've done to help me is to lay out the layout of the new room plus the wardrobes on the floor. The hatched area is actually my new partition wall and all the tape in this area, which is a walk-in wardrobe, is actually the size of the wardrobes I'm going to put in this area so I know exactly where they are. And actually this room has been based on the size of the wardrobe so I can know that I can just about get them in while keeping the bathroom as big as I can. The other thing I've done is set up my laser level and this is why three axis laser levels are great because I've now got a line across both walls the floor and the ceiling that's absolutely coplanar I think the word is it's all on one plane which means without using a spirit level or a small laser level which just gives you one line I've now got a line around all of this so if I mark this on the wall now then when I put my studs in, I know that I've got a nice flat wall and it's not twisted in any way and the top is above the bottom and the walls are parallel to each other. So what I'm going to do is now I've marked, now I've set this up and I've got it in the right position. I'm going to mark all the way round. That really means I don't have to set the laser level up again. I might do later, I don't know, but it's easier to work into pencil marks than the laser level. So if I'll do that, then I know exactly where the studs go in. The other thing I have just realised is the studs conflict with two of the lights there. And I knew I had to take these lights out, but that means I'm going to have to take them out sooner rather than later. Ho-hum, these things happen. So the next thing I need to do is to mark exactly where I'm going to be cutting these tiles, give it 10 mil extra, and see if I can put a nice clean cut all the way down from one side to the other. So when I break out this side, I don't randomly go and break a tile that I want to keep. Fingers crossed. This cheap laser level has come in so useful on a number of projects and would you believe it's £10 cheaper now at only £60 than when I bought it four years ago. I'll put an Amazon link in the description below. I mark the edge of where my studs are going and from there where I also need to cut my tiles where I put down some tape then I can seal the room to keep the dust in as I cut. Ah, cheap masking tape is just rubbish. Ah, no. Gee, man. For this job I've invested in a cheap dust shroud for the angle grinder which worked amazingly well, link again in the description below, and using a diamond blade got me through these floor tiles a lot quicker and a lot more dust free than I thought it would. At the edges I did have to take off the shroud and the guard to fully cut the tiles just to make sure that it didn't crack into the bathroom section that I'm keeping when I break them out. At the same time, I take the opportunity to cut back the MDF skirting at the right point. To remove the tiles on the walk-in wardrobe side of the new wall, I break out a corner so I can get an edge and then use my new cordless SDS drill with a crank chisel bit to lift the tiles. A small cordless SDS drill like this won't have as much impact as the bigger corded types, but it will be so much lighter and easier to hold and use for prolonged times. I found getting the tiles up once you've got an edge quite easy, but where the drill really came into its own is to remove the adhesive from the floor 
which would have taken me hours without this setup. So a great first outing for the new drill. So after a good few hours of breaking out the tiles, making a complete mess and lots and lots of dust, I've managed to clear all that up and I'm finally ready to build this stud wall. And what I'm going to be using to build with is pretty classic stud work and this is C16 CLS timber. C16 is the strength of it and CLS just means Canadian lumber standard. It's a certain standard that means you know what you're getting strength wise and size wise. And this is what we'd call four by two, four inches by two inches, but nominal, which means once it's planed down and it's machined, it actually ends up as three and a half inches by one and a half inch. That's 89 millimeters by 38. So quite often we'll talk about four by two timber. If you put a tape measure there, you'll never find four by two, or if you're American, two by four. So to make this stud wall, traditionally, the first thing you put in place is a perimeter of stud work. That's a sole plate on the floor, a top plate on the ceiling, and then a number of studs. And they're generally, especially in this house, centered at 400 centers. That means they match up with the size of plasterboard. But I'm not actually gonna be doing it quite like that. Let me explain. If this is a hole I wanna fill with a wall, in a normal world, I'd fix my nominal two by four around the perimeter, then at 400 centers along the middle. You can then cut and fix your plasterboard to the studs all the way around their perimeter, job done. However, although the width of my opening is only just over two meters, the ceiling height is 2.55 meters, bigger than a sheet of plasterboard. So a single sheet just doesn't fit without a joint on a non-tapered edge. So I think there's a better way. So let's start again. Once again, I start with a perimeter of timber. This time I had to buy three meter lengths of timber just to cut them down to get the height. Now, I do have a heavy sink to hang on this wall centrally that has only two fixings at the top, two inches square, 50 by 50. So I'm gonna install two double studs to help carry that load. Between these, I fix a central stud, and that's all I need as the gaps on either side are only 500 millimeters, which is still okay for half inch plasterboard like this. The other thing I have to hang on this wall is a medium weight mirror that's got lights and a heating element in it, which hangs from two studs on the back, which currently in this position are hanging in midair. So I decide to put the noggins along the same line so the mirror has got a good fix in to tie into and another set of noggins 1.2 meters or four foot lower so I can install the plasterboard with a good fixing all around the perimeter as long as I put it on its side. Lastly behind the sink I've got a waste and hot and cold pipes coming out the wall to have to come out in the center of the sink for the unit to work. So I decide to slightly offset this one a stud width to the right so the pipes can come out in exactly the right place. So this is a plan, a mixture of single and double studs at seemingly random centers with plasterboard on its side and the center stud offset. The sole plate I glue using PU expanding glue before screwing down to make sure I don't get any creaks when I walk near this in the future. The top plate I pre-drill and insert some screws before lifting it above my head. I've been in the loft already and drilled a small hole next to each joist which run perpendicular to this wall so I know exactly where the joists are. So I'm aiming to screw straight into them, not just into the ceiling plasterboard. 
as well as using cable and pipe detectors before you start this, make sure that the screws you use are just long enough and not too long, which may go through what you're trying to fix to and then into a pipe. My middle stud, which now no longer is in the middle, is going there. I'm fixing the studs here using 70mm timber screws, toenailed in at 45 degrees. You can use a nail gun if you have one, but I wouldn't recommend manually nailing. You'll get everything more accurate just using screws. The double studs I fix in exactly the same way, then tie them together with three or four screws throughout their length. As I can still see the old mirror fixings, I use my laser level to transfer its level to the new studs so I can put in noggins to support the plasterboard edge and the mirror. All the noggins should be cut to the planned gap size rather than measuring the gap. This means if the timbers are bowed the noggins will pull them together straight. Having run out of the crack size screws I resort to using my nail gun to get everything fixed. If you want to see how to cut plasterboard, go and watch my video on boarding a ceiling. I'll put a link to it in the description below. For this project, I'm cutting all the plasterboard in the workshop and bringing the cut sheets up one by one. To make sure I get a nice tight joint at the top, I start fixing with the top of the three sheets, which isn't the easiest way of doing things, I know that, but it does mean that it's the best way to get a good fit where it matters and where people can potentially see it in the future. One area where it's a bit of a challenge to fix the plasterboard is behind this heated towel rail. So I break out a new tool that I bought from a market or a pound shop a couple of years ago. I can't remember where. I had no idea what I was ever going to do with this tool, but sometimes it's handy to have these sort of things in your toolbox for a special occasion. I love it when a plan comes together. This plasterboard is 12.5 millimetres or half inch thick and has a tapered edge. That means it's easy to tape and join as each long edge is thinner than the main board, giving you somewhere to put in the tape and the jointing compound. The fixings here that I'm using are 40 millimetre plasterboard screws at around 300 centres, which is plenty for a wall like this. With everything fixed on the first side, I can now cut out a hole to push through the plumbing, which you'll be able to see how I tackle in a video coming soon. So now my wall is plasterboarded on one side. It means I can put some insulation in the cavity. And I'm not doing this for thermal or heat reasons at all, because both rooms are basically going to be the same temperature. But I'm doing it to cut down on the sound. And the material I'm using is this non-combustible sound insulation. It used to be called Sound Slab, but they've obviously changed the marketing of this recently. You would have seen me use it on the ceiling of my workshop a long time ago. And this is 50 mil thick, it's quite dense, and I'm putting it in an 89 mil cavity. So it's not gonna fill it, but it's definitely gonna cut down on that hollow type sound. And if you don't do it, 
you tend to have quite big sort of echo from next door because there's nothing to stop the sound coming through. So I would advise, if you're going to build a wall like this, put in something on the inside. Don't go for the really cheap stuff because you're wasting your money. Use something a little bit denser like this. Now it is a little bit irritant, just like any insulation, so I'm going to have to wear gloves and a mask. And unfortunately, because I've spaced these studs to suit the sink, none of them have got a 400 mil gap. So this is 400 mil, and if you're building a wall, a longer wall, and you had a 400 mil gap, these would just fit in. Unfortunately, I haven't got this. So I think every one I'm going to have to cut. Anyway, it's easy to put in. I'll just have to take a deep breath and get it fixed. Cutting and fixing this acoustic insulation is easy and before long it's complete, which allows me to complete the plasterboard on the other side of the wall. With the plasterboard fix, I use self-adhesive scrim tape, which I find to be a lot more forgiving than paper tape, to reinforce all the perimeter joints and cover everything with ready-mix jointing compound. I'm using a six inch jointing knife here, which works for me, but my advice is to use what you find easiest. The professionals will use trowels and knives bigger and faster than any DIYer, but that's because they're doing it every day. Use what works for you. After taping and jointing the perimeter, I do the same on the tapered edge horizontal joints. With the main joints filled, all that's left to fill is the screw holes and I'm done. So that's the first side finished. Obviously I've still got the other side to do. It's not perfect but what I'm going to do is leave it to dry overnight, come back tomorrow, sand it down, reapply some of this where I need to. The bottom half is being covered by tile so I don't have to worry too much about that. The top half by the time I'm finished it will be absolutely smooth and perfect ready for paint. This is definitely definitely a DIY job. If you're thinking about doing something like this give it a go what can go wrong? It's not as if you're plastering the whole thing. That's a totally different kettle of fish. Taping and jointing is definitely a DIY job. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Remember, check out my Amazon storefront and my Patreon page, and I will see you next time.